Week four represents the first of the points where there's a very clear overlap and interconnection with the content and both some of the marketing you've already covered in the first three weeks and looking down the track towards the marketing that you'll cover both later in the subject and later in the major. In this particular uh, sequence, we're looking at the external environments to the organization. Now, last week we mentioned the stakeholders, and stakeholders are part of the external environment. But we've also brought together the recurrent ideas of conscious marketing, the marketing for societal impact, which means that we're thinking about what does the world outside of the organization look like? How can we influence? How do we influence? And what influence do we want to exert? We also start bringing the ideas uh, with market segmentation and we raise a couple of ideas here that will come back into real effect in the marketing strategy subject and that's the concept of the SWOT report and the PESTLE report. We'll deal with these this week. The key idea of marketing, the offerings that have value for customers clients, partners, and society at large is now an opportunity to start linking together some of these first phase, first uh, three chapters, three weeks worth of content, and start thinking, how does it interweave? How does it overlap? Where does it cross over? Marketing is a living, functional discipline. It's a cyclical process. And we find that ideas we have in one area, and particularly once we start talking about how you can use the knowledge you gain through a SWOT report or a PESTOR report, but also when we start saying, well, how do we get that information? Oh, here's the role of market research. Here's the interconnections. So one of the keys to studying marketing is to look to how it all plugs together and how it all plugs in. Now, the text is going to cover you the SWOT, but what I want to really emphasize is that periodically people will try and present the SWOT as an analysis tool. The strength, weakness, opportunities, threats. A SWOT is a reporting tool. You don't sit down necessarily and go, what's the organizational strength? You know, there's not a boardroom meeting where you're all kicking around going, weaknesses, we've got them, what are they? What you find is that the SWOT emerges from understanding how do you fit to the market? Who are the competitors in the market? So some of the questions like the competitor analysis, some of the questions like segmentation, targeting, positioning. Do we have a strength? We also think back to things like the GE matrix where it was the attractiveness of the market against the strength of the organization. So we have a reporting tool. It's a two by two matrix. And we talk about this in terms of a summary of organizational strengths, which can be things like your competitive advantage. Summary of organizational weaknesses, number of competitors in the markets, sales figures, whether you're unintentionally marketing, whether your strategies of growth, maintenance, or retreat are not going according to plan, or you're in an unplanned withdrawal, an unplanned retreat, or an unplanned maintenance. Those are weaknesses. Opportunities come out of studies like this, out of looking to see what does the world around us look like. But so they also can emerge from strategic decisions. So opportunities can tie back into aspects, say, around the growth model, where you say, well, we have a product. Is there another market? Or we have a customer base. Is there another product we can offer them? And when you run something like a SWOT and you're looking and going, well, here's a strength and here's an opportunity, you can go back to something like the GE finance matrix and say, is this a viable market? Is this something we should grow into? Is it a cash cow? How does it work? Secondly, we have the PESTLE. 
It's both a summary and an analysis framework. If you do international marketing, you will get to see the pest analysis. In fact, the pest analysis shows up in a wide range of places because it's a neat little seven item summary toolkit. It's a set of headings under which you fill out how do these forces present an influence over our organization from a marketer's perspective. So if we take political, we could look at political as it's one of the stakeholders. Or we could be in the business of selling core flutes and political is one of the markets. Or political is one of our target audiences. So each of these aspects is about, at this stage in your career, understanding what the terms represent, understanding what the key ideas are, and remembering that these are summary tools. They are reporting tools you have greater levels of analysis that you'll need to do so that you can come back with the summary at the end. So let's talk about the levels of analysis. We can think of our connections here as at the customer level and an external analysis. The first priority for a marketer is to be thinking, what are the needs of my customer? What do I know and understand about my customer? What more can I learn about them? So putting, being customer centric in the organization's thinking means the customer's needs sit high in the organizational structure, but are still bounded by what the organization is prepared to offer. So that again, this is why it's an important reporting tool. So to understand the customer, we look at two aspects such as consumer behavior. What makes a person purchase or not purchase, try or not try a product? To understand that further, we have market research, both secondary data, which is the sourcing existing knowledge and repurposing it to benefit a marketer. And we have market research primary, which we're familiar with in terms of surveys, questionnaires. But for the customer to be center, you need to be thinking in terms of how do I know what I know about the customer? What is my source of evidence? And how am I integrating that evidence and that knowledge back into my organization to put the customer at the center of our decision processes? Fundamentally, you know, marketing wants to be evidence-based and evidence-led, so the aim here is to understand these key areas and then feed it back. So you're making informed decisions, evidence-based decisions. The second area that you want to be running your analysis on when you're thinking about the external environment is the immediate environment surrounding your organization. And this is a little bit tricky. At the heart is the customer. And the customer, because they're operating in the market, will be dealing with your competitors. The customer may even be your competitor. Where you're dealing with products that can be delivered self-service, then the customer is both the client, potential revenue source and potential competitor. The second area that you're looking at is the idea of your partners. So an understanding of the external supply line means that if you're looking at who your partners upstream from you, who is your supplier, your wholesaler, maybe you're the person who provides or the organization that provides the raw materials, if you understand their needs and wants, and particularly if you're aware of the changes in the environment for them, then you can take advantage of opportunities. So you can think about this as an opportunities and threats analysis framework. Your partners realize, so you've got supply partners, you're a manufacturing firm, you rely on Australian native forest timber, and you realize it's gonna be mostly crispy and a little bit flavorsome. So maybe we could change the custom. We could target the, a new product or we could go, Here's an opportunity for us to go and work with our suppliers 
and make quite a feature of it, that we're buying from bushfire affected regions, therefore you should support us, dear customer, because we are not worried so much about the profits, but we're thinking about rebuilding the community. So here we're linking back something like an environment scan, an immediate environment scan, can show you an opportunity to use something like conscious marketing to create a deliberate strategy. So you're looking for these links, you're looking to tie things together. You also, there is the external analysis and there is an internal analysis and the, they are separate, but one of the immediate environments is internal to the company. And this can come from where the company itself may be its own competitor. Now, if you look at something like the movie industry, Marvel Studios is in fact one of Marvel Studios' biggest problems because if you are moving more copies of the Avengers Endgame than you are the next three releases in the series, then you are cannibalizing your market. So it's in fact yourself who you have to compete against. But for the most part, looking outside the organization, you're looking to first your customer who does my customer deal with in terms of their comp my competitors? Who do I deal with in terms of my partners? Now, on the internal capacity, again, internal analysis does come up in the marketing plans as a separate category. What we want to also think about here is what are our core competencies? So, if we, again, stepping back to something like the Ansoft Matrix framework existing customer, existing product. So there you have a core competency. You have created something that the market likes. Can you sell more of it to them? An internal, a critical analysis is basically the opportunity to look for elements that feed into the strength, feed into the opportunity. You may also surface weaknesses, but you're also looking at this from the perspective of where's the best fit between what we currently do and what markets are out there. Competitor analysis, again, one of the key here is you will always face a competitor. You may be your own competitor. Your organization's products may have sufficient lifespan, longevity, and quality that people will buy a product from you in year one and by year eight or nine, that product's still going, still providing value, so you don't sell them the major capital item multiple times. Instead, knowing that you've got them as an audience, you sell them things that support that capital item. Toyota makes a car, Toyota sells parts for that car. The car stays being in service and running because you can replace it with genuine Toyota parts made from the genuine Toyota sales strategy of new products to an existing customer. The other aspect to competitor analysis is that your customer is always a viable competitor. Even to very basic things such as self-service and self-provision. If you're in the taxi business, somebody walking home is a competitor to your taxi. So self-service is a thing that you need to be mindful of. Can the customer create a good enough s copy of your product and can will that meet their needs enough so that they become a competitor to you? The other thing that you want to do with the competitor analysis is that it's going to feed in knowledge to your positioning strategy. And you want to ask the questions, what do you do better than the competitor? And also, what does the competitor do better than you do? If you understand how the market perceives you and your competition, you're starting to build up the knowledge you need to create something like a positioning strategy. And a positioning strategy exists where you can comfortably predict the mind of the consumer to say, well, our product, the more expensive version and the cheaper version and be able to name the brands and the products that sit either side of you. 
because when you understand where your competitor is and what your competitor offers and what value they create for their client, it means that you can consciously and intentionally target or evade. So competitor analysis helps feed into strategies, it helps feed into tactics, and most importantly, it helps feed into the positioning strategy of understanding what value proposition is in the market that you are up against. Partner analysis. This is also an opportunity analysis. It's going to feed into strengths, weaknesses, and threats, and it links down further in the chapter. So you're looking at supply lines above and below you, and this opens up distribution. It opens up the questions of, are there alternative providers? Can you, get, can you source the parts and pieces you use to create your product from someone else? Are those competitors interested in working with you? And equally, is the ease to which you can source component parts from multiple possible suppliers an opportunity? Therefore, you're not bound to one provider, you're not at the whim of that provider, or is it a threat? Because these pieces are so common, can someone else come through and build an equivalent, a knockoff version of your product from these alternate suppliers. You're also interested in understanding, uh, when we talk about the pestle analysis, the impact the pestle analysis will have on your supply partners and your retail partners. An economic downturn that drives down prices at the wholesale level and the raw materials level may provide you with an opportunity to take a competitive advantage based on cost, cost of manufacture. But if that economic downturn is also impacting wages, job security, and free movement of money in the marketplace, then that macro impact is going to hurt your retailers and in turn hurt you. So understanding your macro environment influences is important and it's a key part of trying to use these frameworks, use this analysis process, use this thinking to say, what does it mean for us as an organization in terms of our tactics or our strategies? Now stepping beyond the initial window, the external macro environment. This is going to come up basically a little bit of the question of how far into the pestle analysis do we get? Uh, quite a way. But there are a couple of assets that I want to draw attention to, and one of them is culture. Everybody has a cultural set of social norms. You are in a culture, you are in a society, those societies have norms. You're also part of subcultures, subsets, sub-target markets, market segments of that culture. And they have their own shared meanings, their shared beliefs, their shared morals and values. They have key elements, and every society has variants in how strictly adhered to or ignored those variants are. So at any point in time you come across a cultural analysis of a group that presents it as a monolithic singular block, you found something that's in error. There is always variance, and if the reporting doesn't show variance, then it's to be questioned. There are no monolithic cultures, there are no singular marketplaces. Now in terms of some of the things that we're going to talk about here of, of the external environment, these also go on to be useful tools for market segmentation. So some of these key elements are going to recur and this is where you start to see how well the cross-firing supports us. Case in point, if you are looking at the demographics of a target market, a market region, so you're looking at the demographics, say, of Canberra, and you break it down by age, by income, by education, by gender, by ethnicity, you have a rough, raw starting point to start running some analysis. 
how many people have a certain income, what's the pricing structure, who has the highest income, where can we put our stores. Income that's tied to geography starts creating market spaces. So these become analytical tools. What does our market look like? What does the environment look like? And then segmentation tools. What of what we know can we focus on as a decision-making tool? So feeding now into the pestle environment, one of the things that we come across occasionally is people try and just knock out one of the pestles, one of the elements. It's like, oh, I don't really want to deal with political. I make soft toys for dogs. What's political impact going to be on me? Well, to start with, dogs. That means legislation, that means law, that means uh, environmental safety standards, that means um, animal cruelty standards. Political and law are in. But is there a whole thing going on about, uh, is there something in the environment, each of these environments that are also of value to you? So one of the things to understand about this is that you are looking to run analysis, but analysis is always the starting point. The reason why I talk about the SWOT report and the PESTEL report is the analysis needs to come to decision making. It needs to have recommendations. Without a recommendation, there's no purpose to running the analysis. If you're not using it to decide, don't do it. So let's talk a little bit about the political environment. And the first thing to understand is that every act of marketing, every conscious, deliberate act of marketing is political. The personal is political. There are no apolitical marketing activities because we are always excluding someone and including someone else. We are always prioritizing one group over another group. Secondly, demography is political. Now, one of the things about that statement is that what we choose to use as our demographics, the age blocks that we choose to use, generational blocks, they are political. It is a political decision. Do we prioritize the young? Do we prioritize the old? Is there wisdom in the elders? Is there wisdom from the youth? Politics is more than just elections and voting. So the political landscape, the trends, the dominant ways in which uh, ideologies are emerging and retreating, how many different levels of government do you need to deal with? Will you need the government to be on your side? Will you benefit from the government being opposed to you? So if you're a counterculture product, you're like trying to sell that rebellion lifestyle and the Minister for Education is wearing your product, stay in school, kids. It's not going to work for you. Similarly, one of the things that you want to be looking for is to what extent is a political figure who's needing to get themselves some traction, some TV time, get a bit of publicity, going to be able to gain mileage from your product? Will they be able to manufacture controversy by issuing a press release saying, we disapprove of energy drink because corrupting youth and suddenly you've got um, episodes of Quanda being dedicated to, should we be outlawing high energy cola drinks? Should it, you need 18 plus ID cards to buy Red Bull? What mileage can be created, but also then what mileage can you create? What does the political landscape present as an opportunity? Openly taking political stances is a positioning strategy, saying, we will align ourselves with a, an ideology. And most businesses, uh, if you're in it for the money and you're not doing a conscious marketing and you're in it for the money, you have chosen or defaulted to aligning with capitalism. All marketing is political. We can't avoid it. So if you're, in a, if you're targeting into a nation that has a strong neo 
classic neoliberalism marketplace where it's everyone out for themselves, all individualism all the time, your political stance of, hey, what if we teamed up? What if we all worked together? Is contra and running contrary to the political trends of the market. So you've got to be mindful of this. You've got to be aware of this. It's more politics embeds in everything we do. And it impacts on labor laws and it impacts on how the economy's going to go, how many opportunities there are, whether in fact there's strong regulatory safety nets, uh, particularly if there's a strong push towards getting rid of red tape and green tape, then you're going to run into challenges of regulatory safety. If you are trying to maintain a safe product that is high quality, organic, uses a whole bunch of natural processes, is safe for the environment because you're using conscious marketing and you're deliberately creating societal benefit, and there's low regulatory standards as to what actually counts as organic or what counts as recycled, suddenly you find yourself with a competitor problem. So you need to be thinking, what are our trends? Which way is the market going? Which way is the political environment going? So that as marketers, we are able to make informed decisions Similarly, economics, it may not be your favorite subject area, but basically, you, if you're not willing to understand economics, you're doing a Bachelor of Commerce or a BBA, you've got an economist handy. Befriend them, keep them on Facebook, go ask them questions now and then. At the macro level, the big questions are all around how is the economy trending in terms of positive and negative growth, stability, instability, access to capital. Who can access capital is also a political element. The number of startup companies and number of venture capitalists who will fund a, poor, a poorly written, ill-conceived venture by the right target audience they went to the right university, they wore the right shirt, they looked like a, an entrepreneur. Doesn't matter, they don't have a business plan, give them a bucket of money. Versus the ones who go and say, oh, well, look, I funded the female entrepreneur I'm going to fund this year. Irrespective of what the economic uh, patterns or irrespective of what their pitches look like, access to capital if it's been done on political basis rather than pure economic terms. And things rarely ever run purely economic. Things are always personal. The other, all the considerations in economic boils down to two things. Will the market have the income to be able to pay the financial price for your product? Will the market have the time to be able to pay the non-financial price to use your product? So case in point is if you've got a cheap but time consuming product in an environment where everyone's working a second job, virtually everyone's working a second job or there's very little time available, you're running into the problem of a poor market fit. So you're looking here, economics gives you trends but it also sums up to can my target audience afford it now? Will they be able to continue affording it? time, energy, effort, finance. Social trends in the environment, there's, you can make a living from this. So this is the very brief summary. Couple of key points. Uh, the debate between privacy and surveillance goes backwards and forwards, but we're mostly losing that one. Uh, privacy is going badly, but then there will, that will create a market opportunity for private services. Similarly, there's a ridiculously high demand for surveillance-based products because they, well, basically the technology exists and we haven't really had a social uprising against it yet. Spirituality, which includes uh, skepticism and atheism versus religion, which includes spirituality. Which way is it going? How's the market going? 
one of the things that's been very clear is that there's been a revival of uh, some very prudish, conservative, uh, quasi-religion, non-religion growth of if it's not in alignment with my moral values, it shouldn't be. So we, there are trends towards that. Uh, religion ebbs and flows. Honestly, the religion stats in this country that the people who are holding high office have greater uh, concentrations of religion. So getting into politics usually requires bankrolling and the mobilization of a large number of support people. Churches are ideally structured to do that. Therefore, politics swings towards religion. Note the front letter of Pestle. Because religion has an infrastructure that supports politics. But if it's a strong separation of church and state, then the church should be off doing its church thing independently of what the government gets up to. Also, if your religion's worth half a dead bear in a forest, it shouldn't need legislation and government to prop it up. The key impacts of marketers and marketing is social trends influence cultural considerations and they influence purchasing patterns. They influence when there's a strong trend towards health and well-being, that creates and opens a series of markets whilst closing some of the high-end luxury. If we get a very strong religious streak, then we find that, particularly if we get a conservative religious streak, goes through a target market, then hedonistic products tend to drop by the wayside. I mean, Dionysus, you've got to get out there, man. You've got to just start pitching head hedonism. But if you're going for... If you're seeing your society switch towards, or your target market switch towards an influence in their afterlife, then you can sell products based on improving their post-life performance. So again, you're looking at this, what are the trends, what are the patterns, what influence will it have? How will these factors influence my target audience, my stakeholders, and the sort of products I can offer and the sort of communication messages I can send. Remembering as well that a marketer's key is, do I run with societal expectations or do I use that as my positioning strategy to sell to the counterculture and run against societal expectations? Technology, uh, this is the ubiquitous big one. I just want to briefly say that it's very easy to get caught up in technological change as just telecommunications and the internet. Little things like one of the biggest technological changes that's caused a social shift in the world was the microwave oven. And if you're sitting there looking at me going, what? The ability to cook food quickly is one thing. The ability to reheat food meant that there was suddenly a functional demand for really good freezers. Really good freezers meant that there was suddenly the ability to sell pre-packaged, pre-processed, just that last two minutes worth of cooking in the microwave meal sets, which in turn became disposable, which drove a whole series of demand for one-use, single-use plastics, which in turn drove a whole series of demands of improving the manufacturing process for a range of support products. Chuck a microwave in. So the technical landscapes also creeping, I refer to this as creeping professionalism. In the 2020s, in the period between 2020 and 2030, the skills, the fundamental basic skills a person will have growing up in this decade will be added atop some of the other fundamental skills that you have as a, an environment. From 19, the 1990s, in the early 1990s, the mobile phone had started to emerge. In the 1980s, the mobile phone wasn't much of a thing. So knowing how to use a mobile phone is now just a default skill set a whole bunch of people have. Knowing how to use the internet, how to send an email, how to access a website, how to create a social media profile, how to play an Xbox game, a PlayStation game, a 
creeping professionalism, new skill sets that build on incrementally, but also then create incremental aspects of we've got access to stronger technologies that let us use better, more creative toolkits, so it's easier for the democratization of certain skills. When it used to cost $15,000 for a computer, and not a good computer at that, then that limited who could access the technology. The technological has also got a very strong link to the political because as we push technology that is automation, then we ask the questions of what do we do with the time that automation creates for the rest of the market. We ask questions around social technologies, universal basic income, around when we have the ability to track the movement of absolutely everything, everywhere, all the time, that's noise. Do we have value from what we're doing? So technology is an important one, not just the communications, not just the telecommunications, but any place where creeping professionalism, improved skill levels, and improved knowledge base. Was the default understanding someone has to have to operate in a society? What's the technological baseline? Legal, okay. Um, good legal practice is, this is a challenge. What's legal in many aspects doesn't mean good marketing. And what's good marketing may also mean what's what isn't very good legally. Case in point. The major blockbuster cinemas. Uh, we pick the Marvel franchise or the DC franchise, and we'll go for the top, let's go for some solid uh, creativity-driven franchises. So we take the Harry po Potter, the Marvel Universe, DC Comics Universe, and Game of Thrones. The massive amount of IP, intellectual property, that is, held by these franchises means that there's virtually no wiggle room for anyone to come into this area and create Me Too copy products. Yet what makes a franchise really successful is the fan base that keeps giving money to that franchise. Because the Harry Potter franchise should be dead and buried. It's over, people. It's been over for ages. I'm ignoring the Fantastic Beasts films for the purpose of this discussion. But you start throwing in fan fiction and fan art and this training ground of additional fan content that's kept, in the case of Star Wars, kept the franchise alive before there are now nine Star Wars movies. When there are only three, functional fan fiction and when video uh, distribution on the internet became quite a thing, Star Wars, LucasArts created a set of licenses and licensed material to allow people to create their own Star Wars fan films that kept the whole Star Wars buzz going long after it should have been, oh, remember that film from the 70s? So it's good marketing practice. It's great marketing practice to have a really vibrant and engaged community creating content that keeps people wanting to buy into the brand and buy into the brand's extensions. Except it's just horrible on the legalities for copyright law and intellectual property law, patents and trademarks. Same way, legally you can lie in advertising. There's a certain point where it gets, stops being legal, but you can lie just up to the point of deception. You can fabricate, you can exaggerate. And this is why when you look at a picture of fast food, you're not seeing the food you're ordering, you're seeing the ideal of the food you're ordering because mere puffery is a legal thing and you're allowed to do it. If it disappoints your market, that's a dumb thing. It's legal, but stupid. But the key is, as marketers, you need to know your legal environment. Also, there's a whole bunch of things in terms of contracts, contractual permissions, as a marketer who is going to use social media, you need to actually read the terms and conditions of the social media platforms that you're using to ensure that you can actually use it for your marketing activity. 
And a little asterisk here is that in the early days of the internet, and I'm talking 94 to about 2000, thereabouts, there were a whole bunch of restrictions on commercial use of the internet. Pre-90s, it was not legal to use the internet for commercial purposes. It was a government and education property. It was not a commercial platform. Now it's almost illegal to use it for non-profit. Laws are important. Regulations are important. You're going to need to be conversant with what governs the domain you're working in, where your products exist, what are the regulatory requirements, which government bodies, agencies, and levels of government do you need to deal with. So the PESTOL legal side, also adopt a lawyer. We have a whole faculty of them. Adopt one, keep your pet, have an economist, have a lawyer, and be their marketer. It's a good trade. You know, exchange, value for value. The E part, the environment. I'm going to say quite bluntly that five years ago this was less of an issue than it is now and five years time um, they're going to reorder the letters in PESTEL to start with environment because you're going to have to ask yourself the question does the environment sustain my marketing? If you are a tourism operator that is a question you have to now work is if I am selling access to the environment, is the environment going to be there and accessible and the thing that people want to buy? Also, just as a product opportunity, I'd really start investing in Mad Max style tourism getaways. But also the environment impacts on key ideas around how are you going to get the product to market? What's the geography? Canberra is physically, geographically isolated from Sydney and Melbourne, but it's quicker to drive to Sydney than it is to drive to Melbourne, although technically we're the same distance apart. The flight times are the same, but the drive times are different. So if you need to road transport something from Melbourne to Canberra, there are greater costs involved than setting up your manufacturing um, out of Sydney to Canberra. And Sydney's closer to Brisbane than it is to Melbourne. So you've got to ask yourself a question of like, well, I can reach Brisbane, Sydney, and Canberra now. Do I geographically set up in Sydney? Or do I geographically set up in Melbourne and just charge shipping premiums? I can reach Adelaide more effectively. So if you're making things that support uh, wine, the winemaking industry, possibly set up in Adelaide, all these become questions of what are the opportunities? What are the threats? What, do th what threats are posed by geography? What threats are imposed by access to resources? Do I want to make a product that is from rare resources that are finite so I can use a premium pricing strategy? Or do I want to make them from renewable so that I have an ongoing long-term longevity plan? What's the ethics of my supply chain look like? in terms of their environmental footprint, the environmental impact. And environment is becoming an issue not just for customers, but also for the rest of your stakeholders. The environment itself is a stakeholder in the stakeholder analysis, and it's also an aspect to examine when you are looking at what opportunities, what threats exist. So to recap, external ex the examination of the external environment is a or frankly, it's sufficiently robust and large that you could make a career from it. If you want to just look at technological advances, you call yourself a futurist, there are people who've made entire 40, 50 year careers out of it. Legal analysis, there's an entire degree over there. If you're doing a double degree with law, hi, that could be your go-to. You could make a career from this. Environmental analysis, again, we've got um, sustainability as a subject, but we've also got degrees in the area. These, this platform, this understanding and exploring what's out there and what impact it has for marketing is something that will recur across a number of the subjects and will peak again when we get into marketing strategy. But functionally, what you're looking at here, each time, the knowledge here that you're generating here is to help inform decisions. And a set of those decisions will be around, based on 
pestle and based on SWOT, the information I've generated here will help decide which is my target audience that I can, I'm strongest in, I have the best opportunity in, has the least weaknesses and the least threats. Which opportunity arises because my target audience can be identified out of something in Pestle that I can then find that opportunity and meet that need. So this platform exists to provide you information and information that you make decisions with and about. Remembering that all things, SWOT is a report, PESTLE is a report. The analysis happens before and it's summarized and it's written up as an outcome.